Uh, well, that, that was amazing. Uh, we want to thank you very much. Uh, I personally want to thank you very much. I know that it's a, you know, it takes time out of your day, but you, I think, you know, you inspired me today. So I think hopefully other people on the call were also inspired and I appreciate you being, uh, so, um, you know, open to the discussion with us and open to showing your work to us. I think that's, uh, it's really great. And, uh, and quite inspiring. So uh, with that in, with that being said, I think uh, if anybody has questions, we have a little bit of time left, so uh, utilize it. Yeah, thanks, Honor. This is amazing. Uh, there's so many questions that I, I, um, I want to ask. I mean, I think one of the things that you sort of highlight over and over and over again is like your journey in trying to like figure out how to think in this medium, which, uh, you know, I'm, I'm still struggling with. And I, one, of the, one of the questions that I'm asking myself more and more is how to be more lightweight in the way that I work with the computer. And, um, you know, I was reading your blog post about how much innovation is the right amount of innovation. And this is a question that we're constantly asking ourselves. And so this was like a really nice way of framing it. Um, but I guess my, my question is like, shouldn't there really be two, two of these graphs parallel for human intuition and one for the computer? Because like some problems that are grounded um, for human beings are speculative for the computer and vice versa, right? And, and oftentimes like things that our intuition tells us are correct would take us forever to figure out with the computer and vice versa, right? And I just, I, I'm, I'm looking at this graph and I'm, I'm wondering if, if somehow it can help me solve that problem a bit more because I find myself less and less, but still doing a lot of, of falling into rabbit holes, trying to solve problems that aren't important and uh, hurting my ability to be more creative because I'm weighing my cognitive load or I'm adding to my cognitive load with things that aren't necessary. I don't know if that's a question, but no, that, it is. That, that I, might that might also be a product of uh, your environment as well. So you know, think it, don't 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 uh, absolve yourself of that. I'm happy if if it sounds uh, that uh, I solved a little bit of the question, because uh, it, honestly, this problem cannot be really solved. So, which means that you're right. So when you say graph, are you talking about this one or something else yeah. that I should? Oh, okay, you're talking about this one. So just as a background uh, for the people who are not aware of this, again, this is on Medium. And I one of the earlier pieces that I wrote uh, after joining here. So I was trying to say, okay, how much innovation, how can we deal with this? And we always have, you know, some grounded problems. Let's say, you know, oh, we need more floor, square footage, right? So that's a very kind of grounded problem. And you can solve it in a grounded way saying that, okay, we need to extend the you know, plan, that's it. And you, you still, it's, let's say you are not at the limit, so you can do, uh, uh, it's, it's applicable. But uh, what, what it's saying is as you move forward, uh, you know, the North Star is not there. The North Star, like the crazy design that you're trying to get is, I'm saying you have to be very speculative with the problem and very speculative with the solution too. Then you arrive at this, you know, pretty, pretty amazing design. So not every environment can sustain this, right? So, uh, and architecture might not be the right area to, you know, constantly push for that, right? Because there will be, uh, there will be so many limitations. And even if you find the solution conceptually or in theory, uh, the construction technology or, you know, this or that is not going to follow up with that. And forget about that. Sincerely, I think that like the, uh, uh, the the design and you know the, the client in architectural design is a big big thing too right because the client sees whatever is existent in the world now which is like the designs from let's say 70s right and then wants something similar to that so it's very hard to kind of push for north star but if you forget about these kind of like practical uh, problems for now uh, I, I agree because the question is, okay, you talk about insight and, you know, exploration, but how can we make these things more tangible and applicable in our design processes? So uh, the one answer is, well, it's going to hardly happen. That's true. But the second thing is we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't stop because it is, right? So this is the idea that I'm trying to give uh, or, or resonate. Uh, because the, uh, David Bohm is an interesting guy. David Bohm, he's a physicist. 
uh, and he has this uh, article uh, called Information and Meaning. I don't know if, I don't have it here, but if you check other things, there's the, uh, the reference for that. And what he's talking about there is the meaning uh, and meaning is as challenging as the, you know, the question that you just asked, like how do we obtain meaning? How do we create value? And as a physicist, you know, talking about subatomic particles, he arrives at a point, he says, okay, there are no definite answers for these things. No, not one single answer. It's an unfolding action. So you have to keep searching for it and you have to kind of like add as much as you can. One thing that's interesting about what you say is when, you, when you're talking about continuing to try, you're also talking about continuing to fail, right? And I, I think some industries are, are it's much easier for, um, for you to personally like uh, fail in the design process, right? Because you have more time and you know, the process, processes are a bit more lightweight. But architecture, it's hard to fail in the, in the design process sometimes. I totally agree. Yes. It's hard to like do something that's too complex and then talk to your boss about why you wasted two days doing this thing that wasn't really that helpful when you could have developed six options that they sketched for you or something like that, you know? I, I totally agree. And if you, I mean, one great example of this uh, would be, let's say the villa design or house design. The, the, the variety or experimentation that you get in that scale is much broader than, you know, what you can get in the airport design or, you know, skyscraper design, right? Because there's a, there's a guy who is super, exper you know, ex experimental and he has money and he wants to pay for this next crazy little thing, which is okay to pay, right? And I agree, uh, the liability is different too, right? So it's a very, very different situation. I mean, the, the reason for architecture to remain founded in the knowledge that, was, that has been already created is that uh, we also know that the buildings stand and, you know, they, they have a long lifespan and they, you know, this and that. So the liability in, in product scale, I mean, if it breaks, let's say this thing, they send you a new one. So it's a very different, you know, I, I totally agree. You're totally right. Can, I think there's something interesting that you mentioned, though, that I, I think about a lot, probably a lot more than I should. Um, you know, we, we talk a lot about scale, but I think about scale also not in sort of size, but also in time and sort of duration. And I think that that also is part of the equation in sort of um, being nimble. You know, I mean, the, like we mentioned, the, the, the time that these projects take for architecture it's probably parallel to the scale, but at the same time, um, you know, the time that is like, if, if, yeah, I, I just think time is a, is a variable that we underestimate. Um, and it's super important as well. And in, in terms of like what it enables us to do and what it enables us not to do. So, I mean, in, in your, at the scale of a shoe, I mean, there's, you know, there's so many different iterations and so many different seasons and, there's still schedules that are probably scaled to the, to that as opposed to scaled to deliverable of a building. Um, so I, you know, you can't, we can't say like, Oh, well, it's easier in one, one realm than another. But I, I think, could you speak a little bit to sort of particularly product design and sort of, you know, how, how you work with time a little bit and, you know, both time of the product as well as time of, um, the design and stuff like that, I guess, yes. like, you know, okay. yeah, be specific. No. <laughs> what is that? Be specific. <laughs> sure. I will, I will be specific. Uh, it's a so great question. It's a, it's a good question. And I agree. And you're a hundred percent right. The turnaround uh, for designing uh, is uh, one. And also about the time there's prototyping in product design, right? In architecture, your prototype is the last building that you built. We have like two different types of designers. One is the innovation team, which we sit in and our schedule is really not like that. So I'm not a part of the schedule that I just told you. This is a schedule for inline designers who are working on footwear designs directly, right? So more conventional ways. Our timeline is dependent on uh, more research, uh, RD, research and development, right? So our, most of our schedule was uh, working with farm labs, you know, getting the materials ready, determining the right time, the right season for the product to fit in uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, but yes, that's it. And that's being said, while I was doing this, so I 
left KPF in 2009, and one of the buildings that I worked on built, I don't know, 2015, 16, seven six, years. Six months ago, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I mean, I, I understand that. And it was, I'll be honest, it was a frustration. The, the other thing that I can tell you is that, I mean, I don't know if this is a reward or a curse, but I worked on 40 something buildings at KPF, right? So, and I don't know how many were built, but it took such a long time to get the first one. Uh, see the first one get realized, right? And the first one was after I left again. So like in three and a half years of time, I don't, I, I'm not sure if I have ever seen any building, you know, the, like uh, ground was broken. Uh, and, uh, but footwear design so that the shoe with the four foot part was released in my third year in the company. And it was one of the like, very limited products. So, you know, coming, me coming from another field into this, you know, footwear, uh, industry and like contributing with that was a big, big, big thing to be honest. And it's it's a surprise, right? And I agree, you're a hundred percent right. Do you think? I, I guess the other aspect to my question was, you know, I, I see a lot of product design intent now moving towards longevity of product as opposed to you know there, there used to be this sort of you know buy the newest, buy the newest, buy the newest. But now I think that there's this kind of, you know, maybe it's social or, or environmental uh, focus where, you know, if you can buy one and have it last your life, that's better. And, you know, how do you, do you, do you have um, friction in that or is there uh, opportunity or focus on your, on your guys' side about that? Or is there any, you know, like, how do you think that could change your, workflow i guess if, if your timelines for things you know start getting or do you see any evolution of that or at all or am i just kind of hopeful that we yes. only have one shoe for the rest of our life uh <laughs> if you wash it you know uh, once in a while probably uh yes absolutely and i think there are two two uh appro that two potential approaches to that which we are looking into one is uh you know you make it disappear as, as easy as possible. That's the sustainable side, right? So you use something that you don't have to uh, recycle or you know, that remains in nature after it's, uh, it gets disposed. The other thing is about that, those materials is the manufacturing process. The uppers of the shoes, if, you, if you're cutting them, die cutting them from flat material, flat fabric, you are wasting almost equivalent amount of material it it for one it's, upper, it's kind yeah. of like gets thrown out. But if you knit it, right, then it's, it's the yarn and then, you know, uh, and then you are kind of like getting rid of all that waste. So this is, mm -hmm. this is uh, sustainability is one part. Using other manufacturing techniques is the other part. For the 3D print side, it's pretty interesting because uh, the, the, the resin that, the rebound resin that we are using from Foam Labs is, uh, has a longer uh, lifespan than foam. So that, that's really great, actually. I have my, you know, the prototypes I've been wearing for, I don't know, over a year now. I destroy them. I mean, the, the, you know, the upper is destroyed, the foam is kind of about to die and so on. The 3D printed part is still holding. So that's, uh, that, that, I think that's a good, good sign. And imagine that being customized for you personally, which is not happening yet, but it will happen. Then it's then you're changing all this, you know, like the mass customization and the product life cycle is totally changing. So I, I agree with you. And I'm really scared of all this waste that we're creating and we better take care of that very soon. Yeah, I think that's a, I mean, you always, you, you do a great job of segueing into other things that are, are extremely intriguing. I, I, I feel like, um, you know, architecture inherently is this mass customizable, you know, everybody wants a different building. They all want it to perform the same way at, you know, 100% efficiency, but they all want it to sort of visually look different or provide, you know, little flares here and there. But in terms of, you know, product design, you're, you are replicating, you know, even up to the scale of like automobiles, there are replications, right? There's, there's series. And I'm just wondering if, I'm, I'm fascinated by mass customization, you know, in terms of, you know, what I buy is for me and, you know, it's, it's optimized for myself and mm -hmm. my, my program. Um, so I think that, you know, I don't, I don't need to know all the secrets over there, but, you know, um, it's, it just seems like a really interesting avenue as well, you know, 
especially with some of your earlier work where you're talking about allowing the designer, you know, you're creating, we talk about this at Black Box all the time, you know, you create the framework and then allow somebody to sort of like, you know, design it yourself, but you're still, you've designed it because you've sort of created the, the, the sandbox that they can, that they can work in or, or create in. And the idea that I could go online, and I know that there are already things like this where you can pick colorways and things like that, but even if it's more, you know, more performative or manufacturing based uh, specificity to, to me or my foot bed and stuff like that. I think that's really a fascinating uh, aspect to what you do, you know, or what your company does. Yeah, just, just a quick parenthesis about it is that that is already happening for the athletes that we're working with, right? Mm -hmm. So all the, all the athletes like uh, who actually has, uh, they have like Olympic medals and so on too. So their data is being collected in the sports research lab and custom you know, spike plates and so on and so forth are already made. So that's all public already. Uh, and we work with nervous system too. Maybe I should mention them too. So they're like this crazy duo, you know, making yeah. uh, super, super interesting things. So we're really, they've been, uh, they've been actually collaborating with New Balance uh, before I started working for New Balance as well. And uh, they prepared a demo for us in which, you know, it's generating this uh, Voronoi, you know, 3D Voronoi, let's say distribution, depending on a per personal data. And we demoed it at MIT. I think it's been two years already, uh, but it's a, it's a projection to, you know, the future. It's not mm -hmm. happening yet. Uh, but at the same time, we have this, you know, custom shoe line in the factory in Lawrence, Massachusetts already. So you can go uh, online and you can order for specific models. You can pick model, pick materials and colors and the shoe will be assembled for you. That being said, it's not using your data or size, right? But these are, I think these are very kind of like long hanging fruit. So we'll see what happens with pandemic and, you know, uh, what happens next about mass customization. I, I've monopolized a lot of the conversation. Uh, does anybody have anything that they'd like to ask? Don't be shy. All right. Speak now. Anybody on mute? <laughs> no? Okay. A lot of blown minds. Yeah. Um, really great. Uh, thank you so very much. Keep painting. Uh, I was an oil painting uh, minor in, in university as well. I miss it. I don't, I can't here, but uh, maybe my next place uh, of living, but uh, keep going with that, you know, parallel, parallel sides of the, of the spectrum always uh, elicits great new designs. Thank you so very much. If you need anything from us, have any questions for us, please don't hesitate to reach out and, um, and we hope we can do this again sometime. Thank you so very much yeah. for having me. It's really like, uh, it's, it's great to talk to architects and having, you know, visiting, revisiting these uh, not so old memories. Great to see Neil again. Uh, very nice to, and very nice to meet you. Uh, e meet you guys, uh, Kyle and Daniel. Thanks for the invite again. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you so very much for taking the time. All right. All right. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye.